Okay, well, it's seven o'clock. Should we get started, y'all? Okay, um, so hello and welcome to everyone in the audience to the second event in the spring iteration of the Social Justice Speaker Series hosted by the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. Tonight's panel examines race, gender, and class in and through sport. Thank you all for joining us tonight for this conversation. So while I'm reading my introductory remarks and my thank yous, I'll ask everyone to use the chat to share your name, where you're joining us from, and what your interest in tonight's panel is. So when you're in the chat, just make sure that you have clicked panelists and attendees so everyone can, um, can see who you are. Thank you to the event's co-sponsors, the Anne Braden Institute for Social Justice Research, the Commonwealth Center for the Humanities and Society, the Graduate Certificate in Diversity Literacy, the Departments of Pan-African Studies, Philosophy, Political Science, and Sociology, the Women's Center, and Phi Sigma Alpha. We're grateful for the work of WGST Chair John, Heine John Heineken, Administrative Specialists Jen Rayburn and Brandon Harwood in the Commonwealth Center. And let me acknowledge my fabulous colleagues and co-organizers, Drs. Kyla Story and Ann Caldwell. I'm Kara Snyder, she or they, one of the series organizers, and I'm the newest member of our WGST department. I'm so excited to be here at the University of Louisville, and since my area of research is gender and sport, I'm especially looking forward to tonight's panel. I moved to the city three months ago as the uprisings against anti-Black racism and state violence swelled. The world was watching Louisville. Recognizing this visibility, together with the folks from WGST, we conceived of an event that is both a celebration and a demand. We celebrate the vision and activism of local leaders, and in particular, the leadership of Black women, and we encourage more members of the U of L community to join in the uprising. We also acknowledge the tragedy of Breonna Taylor's murder at the hands of the police and demand that all eyes remain on Louisville as the struggle continues. As organizers, we wanted to do a series because the fight for justice for Breonna Taylor and for the black, brown, and poor residents of our city is an ongoing struggle with multiple intersections. Over four panels in the fall and now three in the spring, we've highlighted the labor of activists involved and we hope that you will join them in demanding racial and economic justice. We began the series in the fall thinking about the intersections of education and activism. In week two, we discussed art and activism. Week three highlighted Latinx solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Week four panelists weighed in on approaches to justice, including Brianna's law and transformative approaches. The first session of the spring series organized by Dr. Megan Poole in the Department of English was about anti-racist policy in corporate settings. And our last panel was about racism and its impact on health outcomes. That brings us to tonight. So with no further ado, let me introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Billy Castle. Dr. Billy Castle, she, her, or hers, is the 2020-2001 president of the Louisville Urban League Young Professionals. A native of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Dr. Castle is the Youth Development Systems Administrator for Louisville Metro Offices of Youth Development, Louisville Metro's Office of Youth Development. Her research and practices focus on achieving health equity in Black communities through policy and practice reform. She completed her PhD at the University of Louisville's School of Public Health and Information Sciences and a postdoctoral research fellowship at U of L's Youth Violence Prevention Center. Dr. Castle enjoys working to make the city and the world a better place for our youth. They will take care of us, she says, so we need to take care of them now. Take it over, Dr. Castle. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm so glad that you are joining us this evening. Thank you to the organizers for bringing us here uh, for what I know is going to be a dynamic conversation. And um, we're definitely going to have a conversation as panelists. But we are going to be kicked off with um, one of my favorite poets, and every time I hear her speak, I am in awe, and I love it, and I'm so glad to be able to introduce Hannah this evening. Hannah L. Drake is a blogger, activist, public speaker, poet, and author of 11 books. She writes commentary on politics, feminism, and race, and her work has been featured online at Cosmopolitan, The Bitter Southerner, Harper's Bazaar, and Revolt. TV. 
In 2019, during Super Bowl Sunday, Hannah's poem, All You Had to Do Was Play the Game Boy, which addresses the protest by Colin Kaepernick, was shared by film writer, producer, and director Ava DuVernay, and then shared by Kaepernick himself. The poem has been viewed more than two million times. Hannah's commentary on life and challenging others to dream bigger have been recognized by First Lady Michelle Obama. Hannah Drake was featured on the Tom Joyner Morning Show with Jackie Reed to discuss her international movement, Do Not Move Off the Sidewalk, which addresses the power of holding your space. Hannah was selected by the Muhammad Ali Center to be a daughter of greatness, which features prominent women engaged in social philanthropy, activism, and pursuits of justice. Hannah was selected as one of the best of the best in Louisville, which she is. Um, Kentucky <laughs> for her poem Spaces and recently was honored as a Kentucky Colonel, the highest title of honor, honor bestowed by the Kentucky governor, recognizing an individual's noteworthy accomplishments and outstanding service to the community, state, and nation. Labeled as a change agent, Hannah's message is thought provoking and at times challenging, but Hannah believes that it is in the uncomfortable spaces that change can take place. My sole purpose in writing and speaking is not that I entertain you. I am trying to shake a nation and boy is Hannah shaking the nation. We'll have Hannah kick us off with her poem this evening. Thank you so much. This says all you had to do was play the game, boy. All you had to do was throw the ball, boy. We can sell this auction block well, didn't we, boy? You didn't know you were on sale, boy? Did we tell you to just run, boy? Entertain us, boy. Win championships for us, boy. Stay in your place, boy. Don't you dare get these other black man route up, boy. Didn't we pay you enough money, boy? Why can't you just be satisfied, boy? Stand up and salute this flag, boy. Honor your allegiance to the system, boy. Didn't we give you enough money to entice you, boy? How dare you reject your master, boy? Didn't you like your name in lights, boy? Didn't we stroke your ego, boy? You see, all you needed to do was play the game, boy. Keep dancing for us on Monday night, boy. Make us rich, boy. We don't care if you get hurt, boy. Our job is to break bucks like you, boy. Didn't you know boys like you come a dime a dozen, boy? We can replace you with no thought, boy. Make sure our new boy is a control, boy. Thought you knew we didn't trust Negroes to be quarterback anyways, boy. We did you a favor, boy. How dare you turn your back on us, boy? If you are kneeling, it will be before us, boy. Ain't this game your God, boy? Don't you see how everyone else bows down before us, boy? Don't you know what we do to Negroes like you, boy? You see, back in the day, we let Negroes like you sway in trees, boy. Make an example out of you, boy, so other Negroes just stay in their place, boy. Don't you smell that strange fruit in the air, boy? You see, all you just had to do was shut up, boy. We ain't got to kill you, boy. All we got to do is just silence you, boy. Thank you so much. Um, we truly appreciate it. Hannah is starting us off this evening um, in our conversation and thank you so much. This evening, our panelists include four great people, two I just met and two I have the pleasure of knowing and I will introduce them uh, right now. We have Marilyn Cano, um, Marilyn is from Guatemala and immigrated to the U.S. in 2012 when she was 11 years old. She's a graduate of Iroquois High School in Louisville, Kentucky um, in class of 2019. She is a thoroughbred horse walker in Churchill Downs and also works with the Backside Learning Center since March of 2019. Um, she has a book chapter in Better Lucky Than Good from Louisville Story Program. Let's welcome Marilyn Canna. Next, we have Dr. Brigitte Burpo. Uh, Brigitte Burpo joined the Department of Health and Sports Sciences as a PhD student and Presidential Diversity Fellow Fall of 2017. She earned her PhD in Education Leadership, Evaluation and Organizational Development 
with a concentration in sports administration in spring 2020 and has taught in her department for three years. Her research includes studies of barriers to retention of black women faculty, barriers to retention and promotion of black women in athletic administration, experiences with microaggressions for women in sports studies and organizational behavior and culture in historically black colleges and universities athletics programs. Dr. Burpo teaches courses in the sport administration program and topics surrounding race and gender in the sport industry. She also performs consulting work with small firm firms and HBCU athletic programs, and is also the creator of Black Coffee Chat, social media series. In May, Dr. Burpo will assume the role of Assistant Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the College of Education and Human Development. Let's welcome Dr. Burpo. Next, we have Bryn Sebring. Bryn is the Director of Player Experience and Operations at Racing Louisville FC. She is tasked with creating, maintaining, and elevating the standards at which players are treated daily. She pushes both league and club standards and continually identifies new ways to support players off the field. In an industry where female players are, are severely underpaid in, comp in comparison to their male counterparts. Prior to coming to Racing Louisville in January, Bryn spent her last four years with the OL Reign, the NWSL team in Seattle, as their Associate General Manager. She was also in charge of player support there, while also running club operations, med operations, camps and clinics, and retail operations. Bryn is considered a leader in the industry in terms of player experience and standards of care and is on the ground floor of battling gender discrimination in professional sports. Let's welcome Bryn. Last but not least, we have Daryl Young Jr. Daryl Young Jr. currently serves as the executive director of the Coalition Supporting Young Adults, where he is tasked with supporting Louisville's Opportunity Youth young people between the ages of 16 and 24 who are not connected to school, work, or services. He is an active member of the Louisville community as a concerned citizen, advocate, and community organizer. Daryl is heavily involved in the Cities United Initiative and the National Black Male Achievement Movement, working closely with the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Mr. Young is a past president and co-founder of the Associate Board of Directors of the Nativity Academy at St. Boniface, former co-chair of the One Louisville Love, One Love Louisville Initiative, and a senior consultant with the Racial Healing Project. He's a former member of the Grassroots Community Organization Network Center for Community Change. Daryl is an active member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated and is the immediate past president of the Epsilon Beta Sigma Louisville Alumni Chapter. Daryl is a 2020 Louisville Business First 40 Under 40 honoree and proud alum of the University of Louisville Class of 2012, where he received a bachelor's degree in secondary education. Let's welcome Daryl. All right, so we are going to kick off the conversation. As many of you saw in the recent week, the women's um, NCAA tournament um, players, Aaliyah Boston, Paige Buckner, Dana Evans, and Ren Howard called out the NCAA for the difference between the men's tournament bubble and the women's tournament bubble. Um, we're going to kick it off today with talking about globally, how does sports sit at the intersection of race, gender, and class? And, you know, anyone can jump in and start off for us. <laughs> I'll call on you, Dr. Burbo. I tried to do what my students do and they just sit there and look and uh, hope that I don't call on them. <laughs> but um, when we think about sport, oftentimes we think about it um, from a utopian lens of it is this vessel or this tool that brings everyone together. Um, when historically we know that it has also been a vessel for exclusion. 
Um, and that is in terms of race as well as gender. And then from socioeconomic status now, as we see more elite um, or youth elite programs progressing, we're seeing that there's even more of a divide from a socioeconomic standpoint as well in terms of access to sport. Um, so when I think about, or to, to answer your question in terms of um, how does it sit at that intersection, I think that because it is, um, essentially a microcosm of our greater society, that many things that take place in society we see um, in a very distinct way in sport as well. <clears throat> if, I, if, if I can add to that, um, um, I think Dr. Burpo made a really great point is that we like to romanticized sports as a sport as a sports that figured out this panacea to all of these issues that uh, she raised in terms of racism, in terms of misogyny, um, in terms of capitalism and all these other isms. Um, but really, we, we, we see those things brought up time and time again. And we see um, people really try to use sports as a, as a form of escapism. This country loves to find forms of escape and people always talk about why do we have to politicize sports? You know, sports is this great, you know, um, you know, conglomeration of, of athletes and, and human, you know, uh, talent. But, but really, um, if we really look at it, you, you see the same things affecting society as we, as we see um, still in, in the arena. And I think you know, when we talk about the, the politics of it and the power it has, I think people understand that power um, and are still trying to create those same divides that we see. Um, whether it's, you know, LeBron James being told, shut up and dribble, I think Hannah did a great job of alluding to that in, in her messaging, what we saw with Colin Kaepernick, with uh, LeBron James, with the women um, for the Minnesota Lynx and the WNBA in terms of, uh, you know, standing up for George Floyd and I can't breathe to the women um, in the Atlanta dream with their issues and fights for social justice in terms of voting rights in Georgia. Um, and, and the list goes on and on where we try to make sports apolitical, but sports has tried to, to confront, to your point or your question, Dr. Castle, tried to confront those issues that it stands at the, at the precipice of, but um, just like everywhere else, uh, that dissonance has always been tried to be silenced. And I think just to add in, I was really happy about the response to the NCAA differences, but I think that I think it's important people realize that that is consistent across all sport. That's not just the NCAA doing that. That is every level of sport between men's and women's programs. And it's not just facilities. It's how they're promoted. Um, it's the money that's going into marketing. It's the money that's going into TV rights. It's, it's everything across the board. Um, and that is, is really, I think just like that difference in men's and women's equality in that front is really, a just a like greater representation of what our society looks like today. Absolutely. I think, you know, being grounded and starting off with Hannah's poem really helps us to see these examples of what sports is used as a mechanism for. Like a lot of times truly purely entertainment um, instead of thinking about how even as people who are a part of sports and participating, you have feelings, you have interactions with different systems, you experience things different. Um, and so that is important to always think about. And I think you brought a great example, Bryn, to while well, yes, we use the NCAA, this is happening across all sports. And something I wanted to add, especially as we think about it from a university perspective, Dr. Burpo, your research has examined organizational behavior and culture in historically black colleges and universities, athletics programs. Um, we saw these examples, but as we're also thinking about race, what are some differences we see between HBCUs and historically white institutions, even when we think about resources as we talk about it in all these contexts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 
When I think about the NCAA, um, again, that is another organization where a lot of people, especially at the intercollegiate level, people have a utopian view of what intercollegiate sport is that you have these athletes who are um, oftentimes they're referred to as boys and girls rather than women and men. Um, and also there's a lack of historic context in terms of access to the NCAA and membership in the NCAA for um, in terms of race and gender. Again, uh, for HBCUs, which were not allowed in the NCAA until 1965 after Title III was passed for the Higher Education Act. Um, and even then, when HBCUs were added to the NCAA, that is where the division system came from, where there was um, a university division, which we know now as, as uh, Division I. And then the college division, which we know as uh, Division II, is where HBCUs were added. So even in um, the beginnings of desegregation for the NCAA, there was still segregation within the organization itself. And that was in the 1960s. And then we think about in the 1970s is when the um, Association for Intercollegiate um, Athletics for Women, that also was an organization that was gaining a lot of traction. And the NCAA essentially was, you know, that organization kind of forced the NCAA's hand in terms of uh, providing uh, tournaments and, and, and access to sport for women within that organization again. So when we think about the, the NCAA, we know that um, access in terms of opportunity around the, the identity of race and gender is something that they have been forced into essentially rather than something they have welcomed with open arms. And I think that the more that we have this historic context, the more what now in the NCAA makes sense. So it is not a surprise that women athletes are experiencing these things um, at um, the NCAA basketball tournament because essentially they were not welcomed into the organization until there was competition. It is not surprising that the NCAA is being sued by former HBCU athletes in terms of uh, discrimination or discriminatory practices related to um, academic progress uh, ac academic progress rates, um, which are essentially what determines eligibility and what determines um, your the success of your athletic programs as well. So it is no surprise that the NCAA is discriminatory in its actions because at its inception, um, even then when it first formed, it was not from a, a true perspective of let's help university athletes, it was, we see an opportunity to make money from this particular entertainment venue. That's essentially where the NCAA came from in its inception. And when you have that mindset of, a, of opportunity, of um, capitalism, then of course, when you see people, you see them as commodities rather than as humans. And some of the reaction that we've seen from the NCAA uh, in terms of HBCUs and how resources have um, been disproportionately and unequitably distributed, even with it, with the beginning of HBCUs joining the NCAA and also with the inequitable distribution of resources for women's sport um, until Title IX forced their hand again to, to do so. Um, none of that comes as a surprise to me. Thank you for that history lesson also. And I think some other examples I think of, you know, outside of just the context of basketball, we think about even in Major League Baseball and, you know, the merging per se of the Negro League. There are all these examples of, you know, when systems are created for themselves, HBCUs, be it the Negro League, and then they're absorbed a lot of those issues are continuing. I see you answered about Title IX a little bit, but adding on to one of the questions in the chat that talked about how that's less effective in giving opportunities to women of color and even um, to queer and trans athletes. Like, you know, I think having that historical context that it forces, it, they were forced to use it. And I want to ask you, Brian, thinking about, you know, being involved more in um fighting for equal rights for female athletes like what are you seeing and what can we bring to this conversation as we talk about you know the intersections of which it lies 
Yeah, for sure. And I, I can't speak much on Title IX or collegiate because I have I'm I'm working in professional sports where even even the benefits of Title IX we don't receive um, just because the leagues are completely separate entities. So um, I think what I see, and I think you know, a, a lot of times the things that get the most attention, like in in the recent NCAA scandal is the facilities that men have these enormous facilities and women are, you know, usually operating something like much less, which is definitely the case. Um, something I really appreciate about the U S women's national teams lawsuit to U S soccer, um, on equal pay is that it doesn't just focus on equal pay and equal facilities. It talks about equal promotion. And so when you, you know, oftentimes I think the initial argument that a governing body or a, you know, uneducated fan or someone, they're going to say, well, the women don't bring in nearly as much money as the men's programs do or the men's ticket sales do or whatever. Um, and I, I always hate that argument because really what you should compare is how much money these programs are putting into promoting those different different events and when you look at like an NCAA budget my guess is that their ticket sales promotions their airtime their advertising everything is you know I can't even imagine how differently skewed those budgets are and so it's not a fair comparison to say someone's not bringing in enough money on ticket sales when they're starting out you know the men's event is being promoted tenfold what the women's event is. So I, I think a lot of times people focus on the flashy things like the facilities, like the paychecks. Um, and it's just a much, much deeper rift than that um, with promotions. Even when you're thinking about COVID um, and the effects of COVID on sports in the past year, um, you're looking at obviously teams have had huge revenue loss in terms of ticket sales, in-person ticket sales, and they've seen TV rights deals increase. Um, and then when you look at different leagues like that, women's sports are typically get, getting 75% of their revenue from in-person ticket sales because they don't have the promotion set up and the leagues don't have the uh, sophistication to get these great TV deals or TV networks aren't willing to put them on the air. Um, so so a, a women's league is generally getting 75% of their income from ticket sales versus a men's league, which is usually getting, you know, 25% or less of their income from ticket sales. So when you look at something like COVID, um, that has disproportionately hit women's sports in terms of effect on financials for those leagues, which is why you're seeing women's teams and women's leagues drop out significantly more than men's teams and men's leagues. So I think if we look full picture, um, and push for, you know, increasing airtime, increasing coverage, increasing, you know, sponsorship interest. Those are the things that are really going to increase sports versus just the like, let's all go attend games, which is also great because we love people attending games. It's just much deeper than that. Like the way we really make significant strides is increasing promotion, increasing airtime, increasing like general population interest in women's sports. Cool, I'm enjoying this conversation. So quickly, and I want to, um, you know, just talk about some of those for each of you, what is a significant historical event um, that impacts the way we see and you know, interact with sports and sports figures? I, I'll jump in here um, just to kind of tag onto what I was saying earlier. I think for me, something that I've been really close to and been able to see in this past two years. Um, many of you might not know OL Reign, NWSL team, but you might know uh, a player that plays for OL Reign, who's Megan Rapino. Um, and I was able to be with OL Reign during the 2019 Women's World Cup um, when I think Megan Rapino just like skyrocketed to this household name. 
and got a ton of interest from a general population. And I think that event, just the U.S. Women's National Team, U.S. Women's National Soccer Team dominance at the 2019 World Cup and the interest that the like general U.S. population took in them and their success has really increased the platform for someone like a Megan Rapinoe, the U.S. Women's National Team, and then like a trickle effect down into the NWSL where just the National Women's Soccer Team, which is what Racing Louisville is part of, um, and all the U.S. Women's National Team players play in the NWSL. So, so just like our platform and specifically our individual players platforms, I think really increased after that 2019 Women's World Cup. And that was really exciting to be close to and see the, the before and after um, effects of that and continue to see, you know, Megan Rapinoe get to be at the White House yesterday for Equal Pay Day um, and, and things like that, just getting the recognition that, that she deserves and hopefully to come with the other athletes in our league. So I'll share one really quickly. Um, and I think part of the reason I got invited to the panel at first before I was the executive director for uh, CSYA is because I was at the Muhammad Ali Center. And when we talk about sports, we talk about icons. Um, how can you not talk about Ali? And I just think about when Ali defeats Sonny Liston and becomes a heavyweight champion. And, and, and he's asked, are you going to be a champion like Joe Lewis? And he says, no, not quite like Joe Lewis. And if you know boxing, Joe Lewis was a very demure um, African-American heavyweight champion. Um, who um, was was utilized by the U.S. government for propaganda um, to fight um, a boxer from Germany, and it was kind of around that World War II time when when the U.S. needed to prop up heroes and propped up Joe Lewis um, for this fight, and he won. But then, you know, just because of the way we talk about race and how racism works, and um, you know what we do to, to black athletes and and, and black bodies, um, was really allowed to go into. Um, poverty and become destitute uh, while the person that he beat Max Slimming actually went on to become like a president and CEO or well, not president but a CEO at a Pepsi Cola a guy who was backed by the Nazi party um, was allowed to attain riches while Joe Lewis was diminished and, and had to do all kinds of side uh, jobs and gigs to, to stay afloat but for Muhammad we see somebody really start to utilize sports for the first time as really a political uh bully pulpit to utilize his, his standing in the world to 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 call out the atrocities of of racism and white supremacy um and 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 1960s America right uh, and I think you know we talk about um the 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 men and women who have who have been on the front lines um, and even risking their fame in the way that Muhammad was willing to risk everything, I think is vitally important. Um, one really, really quick thing I want to mention, we're talking about this idea of the NCAA and the, and the double standards of hypocrisy. And one thing I want to bring up is that when men bring up, or a lot of times men bring up this idea that, um, you know, women don't bring in the same revenue, men's sports don't always bring in the same revenue either. We realize that these leagues get money, right? So there are there are conferences like the Big Ten and the Big East and the ACC who have really big powerhouse schools like a Louisville or a Miami. But that doesn't mean that every single school in that conference is bringing in money equally to everybody else, but they share the money, they pull resources, right? So it's just one of those really big hypocrisy moments that we constantly see when we, when we, when we try to deflect from the really legit arguments of, of, of the disparities that uh, Brent and uh, Dr. Burpo are bringing out. And I was wanting you to talk about Muhammad Ali. <laughs> to your point, Daryl, um, I also want to talk about or kind of highlight um, the position that athletes had in terms of athlete activism prior to the Jordan era and how athletes were in that position of, of being activists um, for many different uh, social justice areas. And then with Jordan, it was kind of, or that era where Michael Jordan was, um, he wanted to be seen as an athlete first um, and not necessarily identify himself as a black man um, in the United States. And that was what people began to expect from athletes. And then we get into an era again, where we have athletes speaking up again um, and, and using their platform as activists again, rather than slacktivists. So we talk a little bit about activism versus slacktivism in some of my classes. Um, but when we have them back active, serving as athlete activists, then that is where that extra boost of pushback comes from. Not saying that um, the athlete activist 
in, in previous years or in previous eras didn't have pushback because we know they did and they sacrificed careers, money, all of those things um, in order to stand for something. But I think that the surprise and um, this idea of them having audacity comes from not only them being perceived as super athletes now or superstars and celebrities now rather than just athletes, but also because we went through that period of kind of hush, be quiet and play, you know, shut up and dribble. And now that they're back speaking about about politics and they are taking a stance, there's a lot more pushback and people are essentially confused because they're like, where did this come from? I thought that sport was this great you know, atmosphere that brings us all together. Why aren't you happy and satisfied? Um, and I think that that also lends itself to not seeing athletes as humans, but seeing them as, as these, um, again, commodified beings that are here solely for entertainment. Absolutely. And Marilyn, I want to you to add some context for us about, um, especially coming from Churchill Downs and um, Louisville is known for Kentucky Derby. That's the only thing I knew when I moved here. But I really want you to talk to us about immigrants and uh, even as we've heard the recent stories about the black jockeys and just how that plays into, you know, um, the narrative around the Derby and just all of what happens um, for that fastest horse race um, ever. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> well, um between like the 1875 and 1902, most of the jockeys uh, were black. And that shifted as uh, uh, horse racing started to become more famous, famous and more known. And these jockeys were becoming more wealthy. That created some discrimination against them and uh, why jockeys began to s sabotage the, the, black, the black jockeys in the race. As a result, uh, the owners and trainers weren't hiring them to ride their horses anymore. Uh, we still, like after, even after that, we still see a lot of um, black people working in the racetrack like in the 1980s there were still a lot of uh, black people working in the racetrack um i'm sorry uh but they were grooms hot walkers those jobs uh are kind of there you won't move up as you and you won't be making more money each time as you will would do as a jockey but after around uh my dad he was a horse groom for about 35 years he moved here in the 80s that was uh the time where a lot of people started immigrating to the united states and that was when a lot of people, well, you know, like in horse racing, uh, to do the job, you really don't need a special skill. You can learn it. And that was when it shifted to immigrants. Now, now about 80% of the workers at the backside are Sp from Spanish speaking countries. And uh, due to the discrimination, a lot of the black people that work, that used to work in the racetrack, they started seeking out to jobs outside. Thank you so much for that, Marilyn. It's really, as we've talked about, I think we've talked about a couple of different sports. We've talked about boxing basketball, we're talking about soccer, we are seeing a lot of the same things across all sports. Um, and specifically, as we talk about race um, and gender, you know, as we were talking about earlier, it's looking the same as it looks 
outside of sports for everyone else. And so um, my thing is, and Brian, I want to start with you. Um, what are team dynamics when a team that when a teammate decides to speak out? Like we just gave these examples of Muhammad Ali. We've talked about Colin Kaepernick, the you know Minnesota Lynx. What are some team dynamics? And even Megan, um, what are the team dynamics when a teammate takes a stance? Yeah, I think um, I think. I mean, speaking from my experience in women's soccer, I think this is probably different, my guess, than what it would look like in an NFL or um, probably like a, a major league baseball squad. I think probably have a, a lot of a difference there. But with women's soccer, I'd say predominantly our athletes are um, very open minded, um, very aware of what's happening in the world. Um, so I think like historically our league has kind of led the way in terms of um lgbtq pride equality things so that's been um awesome from our league leading that way this past season um i know megan knelt in 2016 with colin kaepernick and that was like pretty unheard of at that point um that other athletes were were kneeling with him so and I was there with rain at that time. And I think everyone was super supportive, um, very open-minded, you know, acknowledge what was happening. I think it was interesting though, because not no one else joined in. Um, so, so there was a lot of kind of like complacent supportiveness, if that makes sense. Um, and then, you know, I think again, a mirror image of, I think what was happening in the U S or the, you know, the broader world at that point, you know, I think a lot of people were supportive of what was happening, but kind of like, that was just kind of like it, you know, we're supportive, but we're not really going to look into it or dig into it or figure out really what's going on. Um, but I think, you know, similar as it's mirrored kind of our society, like this past year, um, when we started up our challenge cup, our bubble tournament after COVID, um, you know, almost every single person in the league was kneeling and teams were having great conversations. We like our team, we were, again, we were like isolated in a hotel for two months. So we like, there's not a lot to do, but we were like having book club meetings twice a week where we were reading works. We were studying, you know, documentaries. We were just talking a lot about racial issues to just like get everyone on the same page. So everyone had a base of understanding um, and I think, you know, at the beginning we entered the tournament and our whole, like not our whole squad thought they were going to kneel and no one had really talked about it. Um, and we had really great conversations with players and staff, um, you know, just like being really honest and open about what that meant to people. Um, and we got to a place where everyone genuinely felt like they wanted to kneel in support of their black teammates um, and that was just like, it wasn't anything forced. It was just like a very, very emotional, heartfelt conversations between the squad, a lot of trust and a lot of vulnerability. Um, and that was a really special thing to be a part of. I, I, my guess, and I don't have any direct experience, obviously, but my guess is that process looks very different in a sport um, that is more predominantly white males. And that's why I wanted to start off. I know you were saying that it's different across sports, but I just wanted to give the example that, of course, you know, we see that the groups who are mostly oppressed or receiving less services and resources, as we've given examples, are the ones who are more vocal, more supportive, and having these deep and insightful conversations. So no, it's perfect. It was why I want us to start there to really show that dynamic. Anybody else can jump in as to what are some dynamics you may see, and not even just amongst teammates, as you think about society as a whole, when we see um, sports figures speaking out. What's this, you know, reaction that we initially see from uh, people? I'll jump on in there. So um, 
when we do see athletes taking a stance, um, and of course my lens is from an intercollegiate perspective or intercollegiate athletic uh, perspective, um, even with the University of Louisville, when our men's basketball, um, our athletics director made a statement about Black Lives Matter, there was a lot of pushback from people who cheer for these same athletes um, during their seasons. And it's very interesting, this dynamic that people have in terms of wanting to be entertained by the same people that they don't um, see as human or they dehumanize um, on a regular basis. And I think that, again, it goes back to how are we or how will we received in the NCAA? How are we received in predominantly white institutions, um, which is where a lot of stereotypes that we still see on our campuses today came from in terms of black men being on, on PWI campuses because they are athletes and being asked, what sport do you play? And that stems from, again, commodifying black athletes in these spaces and recruiting from that lens rather than recruiting from an academic lens for a very long time at these institutions. Um, and when I think about like teams standing up and because I teach some of these same um, young people who are using their platform, they are raising their voices and saying, I'm no longer going to allow myself to be used in this way, whether it be from um, a Black Lives Matter standpoint or from a women's basketball player standpoint in terms of the uh, March Madness and, and participating, participating in the tournament, it is... I, I, my heart goes out to them because I think that they tend to have a, a sense of a, a rude awakening because they think that the support that they get on a regular basis is genuine support um, for them as humans and as students as well, and not just them as athletes. And so then what does that do? Or I, I guess I raised that question to everybody. What does that do for a team dynamic? Um, what does that do for athletes who are representing a brand and a school, which is a brand um, in terms of your support or your passion for your sport when you know that you are being um, viewed in this way of, of being dehumanized and only you should just focus on your sport, even though these are young scholars, they're not just athletes, they are scholars as well. Now you are... I was going to say, Dr. Castle, to your question of, of, of how, does, how, does, how do folks react when we see these athletes take a stance um, with violence, uh, it's, it's with violence. And, I, and some of the things that just stand in my mind was, you know, I think one of the things that I know a lot of black folks thought about last summer, when we talked about this reckoning around George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many countless others who lost their lives to staying sanctioned murder at the hands of police. Um, you saw people coming together and you saw all these demonstrations of, of unity and togetherness. And then by the time we got a year later, uh, when the football season started and you had the Kansas City Chiefs and the Houston Texans um, stand together on the football field and lock arms, the crowd booed them, right? Uh, they, they even say Black Lives Matter. They just, they just locked arms in a state of, 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 of unity to support, you know, um, race relations and they got booed, right? And then you think about right now, the University of Texas, where um, you have boosters um, at one of the biggest, um, richest um, universities in the entire country who are willing to defund the program if uh, black students and black players do not stand and sing uh, the Eyes of Texas, which is the school's national song, but has been linked to uh, minstrel shows, right? Um, and uh, to Dr. Burpo's point, we, we don't see these um, athletes, um, men or women, um, as actual humans for their humanity, but they're commodities that are supposed to entertain us. They're not supposed to have a thought. They're not supposed to um, go against the status quo, right? They are here for our mere entertainment. And when they win a championship, we love them. But if they speak their mind, we hate them. We just saw that with, um, you know, here in our, our home state. As much as I can't stand the University of Kentucky, uh, when their basketball players did not stand for the athlete, you had a Kentucky State Senator said he cried because his his grandfather served in the military. He took a sign of his respect, as if black folks that don't have family members who have served in the military and who have gave their lives to defend this country, right? But it's a double standard. Absolutely. Whenever I hear, you know, or see 
athletes standing up and protesting like their treatment or wanting to be seen as human for me I'm always applauding them for being brave because it's be, it's very brave you know as you just mentioned Dr. Burpo they're also scholars so if we think about it in the context of you know collegiate a lot of them this is their you know way out and how we are going to build for our family and as a scholar I also need time to dedicate to school and all those other things as well but then I think about it you know even for some professional athletes I know the conversation usually always goes to money of supporting family and supporting other people and that also being a part of either one not speaking out or to, you know, making sure that it's more on the PG side of things to where, or PC, politically correct side of things, as opposed to really pushing um, forward and being honest in the truth of what's happening and what we're seeing and, you know, how that works. Because I even know about conversations as we talk about money, you know, paying players and making sure that, you know, they are paying for these in these bills. It's always crazy to me to hear, and I'll keep bringing up the NCAA, that they're a nonprofit organization. And so as we think about how we are labeling, you know, our organizations and how things are happening, or even to Maryland's point, we don't see ownership in a lot of these sports, you know? The ownership is dominated by older white men across a lot of these sports. And so just thinking about how it plays into not only the entertainment dynamics, but even how we own the things that people we are, how athletes own the things that they are building and a part of is also important as we think about, you know, what we're talking about. So as, you know, Louisville is a sports city and um, we think about it here. I think you all have given us some examples, but one of the things I want to touch on as we talk about youth, since I work in the Office of Youth Development, you know, this concept of the stereotypes that many of them are given as to what you can be when you grow up. And especially for our kids of color, um, Black kids, immigrant kids, like just where you should be and how you should fall into society structure. And so I think you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier about uh, Daryl, just talking about how sports is always presented as a way out, but it really doesn't prepare youth for these other conversations about the dynamics that happen when you enter sports sports, you know, and the support you receive. So if I'm in Little League, you are going to make sure am I going to school? Am I doing the things that I need to do to prepare myself um, to be able to play at these higher levels um, and do all of that? But when I get there, am I, what, what is still there? So I want to kick it to you first, Daryl, about how do we prepare our youth in the community for the dynamics they may get into in high school and even some of the, um, you know, other leagues that are out and then getting into college and or if you are lucky enough to get into professional sports, you know, how do we prepare our youth with the, for those conversations? So I, I, I think there's a lot of things in that, right? And I want to try to be brief because we have such an amazing panel. Um, and I know we still have a lot more to get to. But when I think about what we can do for these young people, I think first off is is that we have to talk about the fact that there's only so many spots. Um, there's only, you know, about 15 spots on an NBA roster. There's 53 spots on an NFL roster. Um, I'm not familiar with so much as, you know, the, the team size for baseball or um, hockey or whatever, but there's, there's, but only so many spots, right? Um, so you never want to kill a, a young person's dream, but, you know, for as many people I've heard, is like, I'm going to go to the league, I'm going to the league. It's like, are you going to go to the league? You know what I'm saying? Like, let's, you know, you know, if you run a, if you run a, a, a five, seven and your friends run a four, two, you know, you might have to temper that conversation a little bit, right? But I think to your point, Dr. Castle, is that for, for folks who are the elite of the elite and who are able to make a team, right? Because you have to be elite just to make a high school team. You have to be elite to make a college team. Um, you have to be elite to get to a, a professional league, right? And even if you're not necessarily a star, that means you're the elite of the elite. And I think I think one of the things we have to prepare young people for 
um, is what they can do with that platform, right? Um, I think we've already said that um, most, a lot of these athletes are defined the stereotypes of being the meathead, the bonehead, the, the jock who doesn't know anything, right? Because the expectation for them has been to shut up and dribble. Particularly that's interesting when we see how many athletes are people of color, right? So it's, it's kind of interesting to see um, where these kind of, um, these images of, 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 you know, stupidity, if you will, uh, come from when we talk about who's, who, who, who are we labeling as the athlete or the expert, right? Um, we talk about who needs to shut up and dribble or who needs to just shut up and, and throw a ball, who needs to just shut up and hit a ball, uh, who is actually directed towards, right? Um, I think so many young people right now are finding their power, but they don't know what to do, right? So they understand, they, they're starting to see the inadequacy. We, we saw these, these women who, you know, were able to go and take a picture and say, well, wait a minute, we, we, we getting, we getting ground, we not even getting ground beef, but they getting steak over there. Like, but, but how do you actually do that? Right. How do you actually spark a movement? And I think our, our kids are savvy enough now to know how to do some of those things. Right. But they still need our help and understanding. Okay. Like, you know, you are a student athlete, but that affords you so much notoriety, so much, um, of a platform. We talk about that all the time at the Ali Center is the fact that what you have is what you have as a as an Ali scholar, having that title on you gives you access, gives you platform. And really making sure that these young folks understand what to do with it, right? Um, as we as we constantly have poked the holes into the mirage that that supports some great equalizer, that supports us some, you know, altruistic um, beacon of righteousness and equality and utopia. It's not that, right? So we gotta prepare, we gotta prepare folks. Um, for when they get there and they, you know, get that slap in the face of what to do with it. How do you use your voice? You know, you, you hear so many stories about how these players, when they understand the collective bargaining agreement is not made for them and they're getting, you know, you know, uh, the worst back end deals. How do they actually stand up to an owner? How do I actually, you know, be able to say Black Lives Matter and not risk getting cut from the team? Um, how do I, how do I be able to go and say, hey, you know, the men's U.S. team, they get their, their butts kicked every year and, they, and they're getting paid millions and we're out here winning championships and we can't even, you know, you know, get even a quarter of that. Right. So how are we preparing them to actually utilize that voice, utilize that that um, discerning eye and actually do something with it? Right. And I want to get. Uh, Marilyn to answer this question and I'm going to, I see your questions in the q and I'm jumping in with some and I'll circle back to the others in our Q&A in just a bit about how has COVID affected the after school programs? Were there resources for immigrant children at Churchill Downs to continue education? As we were talking about what do we do with our youth um, who are around us? Um. Yes, uh, COVID has affected the after school programs, but we actually like figure out how to work it out and still um, be able to, to support our kids. Uh, we started a, a hub for the kids where we all were also providing uh, transportation to a few of them to keep supporting them with their virtual work and we're also doing virtual tutoring with other kids that can attend the hub since uh, the our parents uh, have trouble helping them uh, because of technology and the language, we're doing our best uh, to keep supporting them. Thank you so much. You all, I'm really enjoying this conversation and all of the dynamics and thinking about all the sports that we are, you know, listening to. So um, as we're wrapping up, because we're going to hit the question and answer, um, I want us all to answer as we um, finish this out, um, what's next for sports? Um, for thinking about Dr. Burpo, um, and just overall, how can 
not just Dr. Bofro, Brian and even <laughs> Daryl and Marilyn. How can institutions continue to support, for example, student athletes, families, as we just talked about, the youth at Backside Learning? Um, and how can we support the social movements to make sure that a lot of what we're hearing from, you know, women, uh, Black athletes, um, those at HBCUs, and all these examples we've given tonight are um, getting the resources they need um, at their competing levels, but also um, to see them as human. Um, and uh, some of this goes with one of those questions. I think, Brian, you kind of answered it in the chat. So bringing, bringing that in too, as we wrap up, that's everybody's final question. I'm gonna kick, kick it off with you, uh, Marilyn. If you can answer that last question we have, what's next? I am sorry, my camera is off. My internet was acting up. <laughs> well, what's next in sports? It's, I'm hoping uh, more diversity and also more women to keep practicing sports that they love without uh, not being scared <laughs> to what the rules are. I think from a professional sports standpoint, one of the one of the best things that organizations can do to support their athletes is um, is both provide a platform and protect provide protection. So allow an athlete to speak whatever they want to say, and then make sure that on the backside of that, there's no repercussions in their contracts, in you know how many minutes they're getting, things like that. So so listening, being respectful allowing, you know, enabling them to utilize their platform, um, furthering, you know, what they're saying, furthering what they care about um, on, you know, cl club wide or league wide platforms, and then really protecting that athlete so that they know that they can say what they feel and not have any repercussions. I'll say from an intercollegiate perspective, um, as an industry within the sport industry, we really have to be real with ourselves um, as colleges and universities. And we have to assess what does our athletics department actually look like? Because it's one thing to say that Black Lives Matter and to say that you value equity and inclusion, and then to have a predominantly white male athletics department or a high level of occupational stratification where women are saturated in your academic uh, support services. And then you have men making decisions related to marketing, communications, finance, and all of the things that really get those wheels moving within athletics departments. So it's one thing for leadership to make a statement to say we care about black people we care about people of color we care about women and then you look at your organizational chart and it does not reflect that so I think that we have to be real we have to create more opportunities for access for women and people of color um, and women of color as well um, because we are extremely underrepresented in um, intercollegiate athletics as well in terms of administration and oftentimes when we are thinking about how can we support student athletes, well, it helps to have some people who look like those student athletes in decision-making power, um, helping to make decisions that positively affect them rather than positively affect the organization. And then if, you know, if some trickle down effects of, of you know, great things happen to those athletes, then, then that's wonderful. Um, I think that also in terms of what's next for intercollegiate sport, I think that the developments with name, image, and likeness are about to really um, change things in both a good and bad way. So a lot of the a lot of the athletics departments that are already struggling and are considered limited resource institutions, specifically historically black colleges and universities that are unable to compete with the Power Five because the Power Five is pretty much doing what they 
are able to do, which is what the NCAA allows them to do, which is anything. So um, if you have more power, both economically and in terms of structurally, you have more power within an organization, then that, again, separates, creates an even bigger divide a larger divide for those organizations that are already struggling to continue to provide athletic opportunities for students. Um, So I think that though name, image, and likeness will be something that will um, give a lot of student athletes more agency, it will continue to create a divide uh, between the Power Five and other institutions that are continuing to struggle. I think, so, I think about this question in two ways. One, in terms of where we're going or where we would like to go, um, right? Uh, you know, we 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 gotta we gotta quit trying to put the bandaid back on when we when we when we rip it off, right? We we we've seen the disparities between, you know, um, men's sports and women's sports. We 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 recognize and we can swat down all the excuses that people make on why they have to exist, right? So we know that that's not right, right? We know that these, you know, uh, predominantly white institutions. Um, biggest um, source of of black and brown students are the sports teams, right? And so these black and brown bodies are allowed to make millions and billions of dollars for for these universities. And then the universities go around and we only see, you know, the black male retention rate on a lot of these campuses only hover around 10 to 15%, right? That can't happen anymore, right? We we know the atrocities that, and the inequities that happen around sports. What I say, what I say though, in terms of what I'm afraid of is that I think one of the most, the, one of the scariest moments to me um, was last summer. I mean, you know, you had the, you had the NBA, um, you know, try to acquiesce to the players' concerns, and you know, you if you watched the NBA, you saw that you know players were allowed to put different issues on their on their jerseys on on you know on the back of their jerseys. So you had players talk about police brutality and um, player reform, and some people even put like you know Breonna Taylor on their jerseys and stuff like that. And you saw Black Lives Matter on the court, but um, and I can't remember the brother's name who was shot um, in in, um, in Milwaukee um, or outside of Milwaukee. But um, you actually had the players do something that people been talking about for years, right? It's like, well, if they if they're really about it and they really care about social justice, they they should just not play. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't George Floyd. It was another brother. He was shot. He was, uh, shot. He, he didn't die, but he was paralyzed. He was partly paralyzed. I can't remember what happened in, happened in Wisconsin. Um, and it, and it caused the Milwaukee Bucks to not to play that night. Right. So the NBA shut down, um, the WNBA shut down that night and, and even the MLB, right. The uh, Milwaukee Brewers, all the, all, all the Milwaukee teams, um, decided not to play that night. And then the league sent in solidarity and they canceled sports that Wednesday night. Um, and it was it was crazy, right? Nobody ever thought that we would ever see a day when the athletes would actually not show up for the game. But the very next day, I think it was I think by Friday, all the leagues were back, right? So we saw athletes' biggest, you know, weapon, the you know, the biggest trump card they had um, was used, and it only lasted for about forty eight hours, right? So I. As, as much as we want to, you know, trumpet these athletes as heroes and having this large platform, um, they can't do it alone, right? We're seeing, you know, just in terms of what we're seeing in our country outside of sports, we're seeing, you know, all these um, states, you know, you know, create these draconian voting um, restrictions around people voting, right? Um, folks, we got to stand up because, uh, you know, we, we often try to, you know, find the celebrity or the, or the high profile person, but um, I think I heard a few people. I think I heard uh, Brent and Dr. Burpo say we have to support these athletes because um, they can't they can't be left alone to trumpet because they have a lot of money and a lot of uh, celebrity. Absolutely, I have truly enjoyed the conversation, and I think you all provided four different examples. More than that, um, of what we can do to support, especially thinking about women, um, black athletes, athletes that are standing up and standing out, really supporting them because they are being brave and need our support. And we need to drown out the violence that may be the answer to when they um, stand up. So those are the questions we have. And so I will read some of the questions from the chat and then we'll, you know, keep wrap it up with something as well. So um, we have a question. I was wondering if you could speak to the differences on how athletes of color, women athletes, trans and queer athletes are reported on 
and spoken about in comparison to their white, cis, heterosexual male counterparts. And Brian, I'll also add some of what you were talk, um, saying in the chat about how a lot of people, um, the promotion of women's sports has relied on, you know, sexualizing athletes. Can you help us bring all of that together? Um, and I know you were getting into some of that in the chat. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think in terms of over sexualizing female athletes, I think we've come a long way um, recently. In that sense, I think the more to me with female athletes, like the more we focus on their athletic athletic ability versus their gender, um, we're moving in the right direction because no one is talking about a male athlete and saying, "Oh wow, you know this." they can jump that high and they're a guy. So that's incredible. Um, but that's always kind of the asterisk on when you're talking about a female athletes, um, athletic achievements, they, you know, it's always like, Oh, wow. Look at this incredible goal. And it's a woman that scored it. Um, so for me, that's a big thing. I think, um, soccer is a really interesting sport where, there are a lot of teams, many, many teams in, you know, predominantly white countries have uh, almost like predominantly white squads, which is different than some of the other um, major sports that we see. And I think one of the really interesting ways that I see differences in the way that media covers predominantly white teams from like, like looking at, you know, men's World Cup, we're looking at the English squad predominantly white squad and then you look at your know, squad from Africa that's predominantly black um commentators will often say things like about the white squad like oh wow they're such smart players or oh wow look at how well they understand tactics um things like that and then when you, they're talking about the black teams they're saying oh wow this team is so athletic or wow, like look at their physicality. Um, and just really that difference of focusing on a, a predominantly white squad's intelligence versus an a pr predominantly um, colored squad's physicality um, and athleticism. So that's a big difference that I see in a soccer world is a specific um, example of that. And then, you know, in terms of, of covering women, I think when you look at in the U.S. sports um, reporting landscape, women's sports are getting 4% of the coverage. So of 100% of the coverage, women's sports are getting 4%. Men's sports are getting 96%. And, and that's a huge issue. Um, and that I think just transcends to all these further issues, you know, of, of how many companies are interested in sponsoring women's sports if they're only getting 4% of the airtime um, and things like that. So I think that's a huge discrepancy that explains a lot of the disparities in the rest of, you know, in the rest of the sports landscape. No, that's great. Um... I think about that with one of my favorite athletes of all time, Serena Williams, um, in the conversation around her accomplishments and, you know, how she is as an athlete. And for me, she's the greatest sports person, like, regardless. Um, but I think a lot of people for in this example, as you were mentioning, you know, try to discredit her because she is a woman and a black woman um for her being the greatest of all time and so definitely see those examples of when is it enough you know we see some mediocre um men who receive all these act like hyped up and don't deliver as much as we see a lot of women are delivering. And so I'm absolutely with, you know, I want more promotion in time of seeing these great dominant women's sports um, because they are, they need the promotion, the exposure and just as much money spent um, for us to see all the dynamic things that they do. <laughs> 
Um, next question, or anybody else want to add to that one? What can students do to support the underrepresented women, people of color, and women of color? How can we create change in our community? I really don't like to just call on people. <laughs> so I, when I when I hear that, right, um, I, I'm. If you heard my bio, I'm, I'm big on organizing and, and organizing principle is that people come together, right? And so you have these athletes with these big platforms, but they don't necessarily know, they might not have been as aware of the message or the, as the history. Um, so collaborating with folks who have that prior knowledge, who have those that skill sets, you know, merge merge the voice with the platform, right? Um, if, you, if you see these folks, so I'm, I'm taking that question as, as how, how can students support these athletes of color and these, you know, uh, black athletes and brown athletes and, you know, uh, LGBTQIA plus athletes. Um, so I'm, I'm answering it from that vein. It's, it's really just working in coalition, right? Um, I think we've all said that we can't just let them stand alone, right? They, they need our help and support. So I, I think stand in coalition. I think, you know, um, just because they have a big platform doesn't mean um, that you are off the hook because you don't have a big platform, right? Like we need everybody trumpeting these things, right? We need everybody amping this stuff up, right? Because for a lot of people, it's like, well, I just don't know. Uh, a lot of people don't have any clue how, you know, their local government works, right? So these things happen and they're like, well, I didn't know that we just passed this bill or that this thing is happening and I can't do this now because we're not taught that, right? We're not, we're not supposed to know those things, right? So I think it's really, how can we link arms with athletes who have that platform, who have this large voice that people will listen to, who have, you know, TV and radio and internet who will, ask their opinion, how can we work with them to really, you know, educate the masses and really move and, and push the masses on these things that we know that matter and are important. Absolutely. And I see someone else adding in, also, may we we may have to start with ceasing to use language that is offensive to historically marginalized folks. Absolutely. Um, we have to do a lot of that work um, in everything that we do um, and making sure that we are holding our counterparts accountable and everyone else as we, because um, I know there's been multiple examples um, as we think about it's what 2021 and we still have the Redskins. So, um, and there are multiple examples um, of using language that is offensive. And so we also need to make sure that's included. And I would add that as we talk about how can students support um, we know that language has well been a part of, um, especially if we hear about a lot of Black athletes in the words that they are called, even do when, you know, they're playing and they can hear it. And there's all these stories that we've heard of, you know, as Hannah mentioned in her poem, calling a boy or girl and um, thinking about it in those terms and um, a lot of them being called the n-word a lot of times in their while they're playing um, making sure we are included that in our conversations too. Dr. Berger it looks like you. Yeah so I wanted to talk about that language piece as well because oftentimes like I mentioned earlier that I've heard um, student athletes referred to as girls and boys or uh, kids rather than men and women and these are adults you know these are, are grown people they can vote. And so even in classes where I'm teaching people who are the same age as these athletes, I've heard students refer to their peers as kids and they wouldn't refer to themselves as kids. So I think that in terms of language and the way that we talk about things, words mean things. And that also means that's how you see those individuals. If you see them as kids, then that means that you see them as um, underdeveloped or not as mature as you would see, as you would speak of other college students. Um, and so I think that language, again, I, I say this all the time because it really is important that words mean things and whether you intentionally manifest things into existence, sometimes those things happen. So um, language, not only with students, but also with faculty, um, with our staff, the way that we talk about our student athletes, the way that we underestimate their ability, um, the assumptions that we make about student athletes all wanting to go to the professional level where I've talked to many student athletes who want to be teachers and counselors. 
um, and attorneys and they want to be um, news anchors and they have normal goals that are outside of being athletes. And then there's something else that I think of when we talk about language and there's this idea around um, student athlete identity. We talk a lot about how student athletes at, at particularly power five institutions have strong athlete identity. But if you always refer to them and interact with them as an athlete, you don't know their other identity. You don't know what their other salient identities are. So I think that one, we can start to change the way that we speak about student athletes. We can change our perceptions about them and understand that they are students as well. Um, and then I think that we should also kind of check our biases that we have related to athletes and what we perceive them as um, in terms of their what they find important, their values, their intellectual ability, all of those things. Any other questions we have? Thank you all and thank you community for the chat. This has been a great discussion. Um, I'm learning a lot and hopefully we're all learning things that we can take away and include in our daily work um, and our fight to um, make sure that, you know, even with the knowledge that we have um, now, I think that there's no hiding it. If you know things don't change, it's because people willfully do not want to create equity and they don't want to see equity in a lot of the things in our example of talking about sports this uh, evening. Um, they don't want to make it equitable because even I think as we've talked about COVID highlighting a lot of things that were happening um, in terms of uh, structural racism and its impact and how we see a difference in how everyone's experiencing education, food, housing, sports, all of those, you know, social determinants of health, um, you know, the conversations and the movements that we've seen over the past um, coming up on a year make it hard for us not to be able to uh, really instill a lot of those things into practice because it's one thing to say it but it's another thing to do action um, it's hard for those actions to not be followed especially after we saw a lot of the institutions that we're even talking about who you know this summer we're celebrating Juneteenth you know, giving holidays to officer, uh, giving holidays to, you know, workers, or even for that matter, um, just making a statement. It's not just about tweeting or putting out a statement. It's truly about action and making sure that we are um, acting on everything um, that we understand now and there's many examples of how we can implement change to live a better life um, and for everyone to have better experiences um, by destroying systemic racism and white supremacy. <laughs> and so with that, you know, as I uh, wrap us up on that huge note, <laughs> I wanna thank you all for this conversation this evening and for really, you know, going there. We have really highlighted a lot of things that we hear in conversations or we may talk about, but um, thank you Women and Gender Studies for this platform to be able to have the conversation and really provide action for what we all can do next. Um, for me, I don't like to just have a conversation. I like to leave us with some action items so that we all take away things when we go home. So we've heard language. I'm very much teaching right now. So we've heard language. We've heard support um, for our student athletes um, and athletes and making sure that um, even if we have, as we see an increase in diversity and equity, and inclusion initiatives, um, we also see that representation in the administration and the leadership so that as Dr. Burpo mentioned, um, we see people who look like us making those decisions and making sure we are reaching a more equitable world. Uh, so with that, thank you all for joining us this evening. We're gonna wrap up a little earlier. 
Um, have a great evening. Um, nice to meet you all. Thank, thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Bryn. Thank you, Daryl. And thank you, Dr. Barco, for your knowledge and that you brought this evening. And then thank you, Hannah, as well, for kicking us off with your dynamic poem. Um, again, a favorite of Kentucky. So thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you. You all take care.